What is good? Let's have some fun. It's the Fundamism Podcast with your host, Paul J. Long, and all things fun. We'll let the fun begin. What is good, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Fundamism Podcast. You are all in for a treat today. I, as always, am your boy, Paul J. Long, here talking about principles of a fun and optimistic lifestyle. So we aim in every single podcast to interview folks that appear, at least outwardly, to be having fun in life and bringing a little more joy to everybody else and and talking about stuff that that not everybody else is talking about. So super excited about today's guest. Before we get into that, we're brought to you, as always, by our friends over at Charlie Hustle. Charlie Hustle, an absolute ambassador to uh, Kansas City, but I would argue not as much of an ambassador as the gentleman that we have on the podcast today, president of the Negro Leagues Museum here in Kansas City, Mr. Bob Kendrick. How you doing today, Bob? Paul, I'm doing great, man. So so good to be on the show. Thanks mm. for having me. Hey, listen, so Charlie Hustle, they do a great job in, in outfitting people with some fresh duds, but you and I both know that only one individual in our city has the best dress <laughs> title, and that's you. Like, uh, so I, I rock the bow ties regularly, but can nobody shine a candle to you? No, but you're rocking it well. <laughs> you're rocking it well. So first question that we start off with every guest, Bob, uh, you've, you've gone through a challenging week. Just envision one of the most challenging weeks you've ever had here. And we'll talk about that, I'm sure, yeah. one of them. No, there plenty. What do you do for fun? Like, what gets you in a positive headspace? What, what gets you in a place where you're, where you're in a better place when you're not worrying about, you know, the mess? I'm a golfer. You're a golfer. I'm a go- I'm a golfer now, and, and let me say this: I'm an avid golfer. I didn't say I was a good golfer. Okay, those two different things. Sure, but I'm an avid golfer, and and you know, is I would pick a sport that would frustrate you to no end <laughs> to be the thing that I get away from the stuff that I need to get away from. Sure, but no, I I, I love golf, and these days that's the one thing that. I do probably more so than anything when I'm not here at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum and chasing after my granddaughter. Oh, you got a granddaughter. I have a seven-year-old granddaughter, and so, you know, uh, she is one of the joys of of my life. Uh, I had three boys. Uh, My wife and I have three boys, of course, and... That was a good fix that you just threw in there. Yeah, 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 (laughs) yeah. And, you know, I think I always wanted a girl, but I'm the baby of six boys. Okay. And after the first two and then my stepson, I realized that I may be following that same pattern that my parents was following. So I stopped at two and then, my, then I got married and of course I have a, a wonderful stepson. And because I, I seen that pattern developing, so now I live vicariously through some other folks. But you know, to have my, my first grandchild be a, a girl and, and she has both me and her father wrapped around her fingers. Sure. So, What's Absolutely. her name, if you don't mind me asking? Demi. Okay. Yeah, Demi What's Rose. the most, uh, Demi? Rose. Rose, beautiful. What's the most memorable moment you've had with uh, little Demi Rose in the last month? Well, I tell you, she comes over and I'm just the apple of her eye. Oh, yeah. you know, I, that, and that's a wonderful thing. You know, I, she, for me, I can do no wrong sure. in her eyes. Yep. And, and I take great joy because she told her grandmother that, you know, my grandpa Bob is a mega star. <laughs> And that's the at, truth. At, at seven years old. <laughs> at seven years old. I was like, well, little girl, where you hear about mega stuff? <laughs> so in her eyes, I'm a mega star, no hey. matter what other per- people might think. Uh, but in Demi's eyes, her grandpa is a mega star. Uh, Mr. Kendrick, I would, I would argue that, and you told me to call you Bob, so I'll get back to that. <laughs> uh, I would argue that many folks, especially here in the Kansas City area, and I know m- many major league ball players would classify you as a megastar too. And mainly it's because of your selflessness and your willingness to give to a bigger cause. So before we get into a little bit more about what makes you tick and, and all the wonderful stories that you got for days, tell us a little bit about your background and what, what, where are we at? Because this is gorgeous. Yeah, we're sitting on the field of legends here at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And the field is the centerpiece of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And I'm biased. I'm going to say that <laughs> right off the bat. I am biased. But I think it is one of the most amazing displays in any museum anywhere in the world. 
When people walk into this space and they look into the eyes of these life-size statues, you feel it. That's true. Yeah, you feel it, whether you are a baseball fan or not. And, and one of my favorite memories, 1997, when we had the grand opening of the new museum where we are now. And you were a volunteer at this point? Uh, and at that time, I'm still a volunteer. Okay. Still a volunteer. And we had organized what became one of the largest grand opening celebrations in Kansas City history. And my dear friend, the Wizard of Oz, Ozzy Smith. Yes, sir. Is here at the Negro Leagues Museum participating in that grand opening celebration. And when he walked out on this field, he said it was one of the most eeriest feelings he ever had. It was very emotional for him because, Paul, he understood that he stood on the shoulders mm. of these immortal athletes so that he could become the wizard, so that he could have this Hall of Fame career. It's no ands, ifs, but about it. It doesn't happen had it not been for these heroes of the Negro League. If you are of African-American or Hispanic descent, you don't play in the major leagues had it not been for these legendary athletes. Sure. And he understood that. And so when he walked in and he looked in the eyes of Ray Dandridge, who we're sitting next to, or over there in left field, another fellow St. Louis and cool Papa Bell, you know, the respect there. You respect what they were able to do in the face of adversity, but you also admire the great talent that these, these players possessed. They were stars and would have been stars in any league. And so for me, when the current day major leaguers come here, that's the thing that we talk about. We talk about passion. Yeah. And that's the thing that is kind of unifying. Mm. That's the bond that they share with these players from the Negro Leagues. We've been moved beyond a segregated society. But the one common denominator is love of the game. Love of the game. Yeah. And, and I think sometimes we don't think the current players love the game the way they did back then. Sure. Because we kind of relate everything to money. That's true. Yeah. We look at how much money they make. Right. Uh -huh. But these young athletes love the game of baseball just as much as anybody else. They are making a great living playing the game that they would indeed play for free if they had to. But they're afforded an opportunity to make a great living to do so. So, yeah, they love the game. But as I share with them, you will never see a greater example of love of the game than you do when you come here. They had to love it in order to endure the things that they had to endure. Sure. Yeah, so what would propel me to say, I'm going to sleep on the bus and eat my peanut butter and crackers? Because I can go ride into a town, fill up the ballpark, but not be able to get a meal from the same fans who had just cheered me or not have a place to stay. So yes, they sleep on the bus, eat the peanut butter and crackers until they could get to a place that would offer them basic services, but they never allow that, those hardships to kill their love of this game. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that, um, that I find interesting, I was talking to the uh, gentleman recently that played football down at LSU several years ago. And we were talking about how, for one reason or the other, I don't know if times have changed or not, but it seems like back in the day, people would enjoy sports because it was an experience, right? It took you away from whatever struggle you were dealing with. Or, you know, we have Negro Leagues Day, uh, yeah. you know, Dressing in the Nines Day yeah. at the K, which is actually the first time I ever met you, uh, Bob, uh, the, rev the reverend. Uh, Mr. Emmanuel oh, Cleaver, Cleaver. Yes. he spoke, and I got my sock 101, uh, Casey Monarch <laughs> socks, and of course you were there dressed to the nines, and that is just a tremendous, tremendous outlet for many to dress up and have fun for family. Yeah. It's an experience, gotcha. right? But, you know, the Royals, they were hot 14 and 15, right? And probably not news to you that we've fallen off just a little. A little bit, but that's okay. But we'll what's be back. That, that's true. It's absolutely true. We got a nice crop of youngins. But what's interesting about the experience is if, if you ever tune into sports radio or, you know, you hear people talking about the Royals, people get so irritated about the coach. Or they get so irritated about these guys. Why, why, hey, why are they still playing first? Or why is he still making 55 minutes? Whatever it may be. And it just seems that over time, we've become more focused on the outcome of the game than the experience of the game. Yeah. So one of the things that really resonates with me is the fact that back in the day, these gentlemen, you could not argue their passion. They did what they loved. And I would take that even one step further. Not only did they have a love for the game, they had a love for life. Of course. Because they, they dealt with all these challenges, but yet the stories that you hear, they're always lifting other people up. 
always the uh, most amazing stories in the world, and, and you got them all. We're going to talk about They have the most ana- amazing name. Cool Papa Bell? Cool Papa. What's the best nickname of any player that you enjoyed? Well, I, I honestly, I believe Cool Papa is the greatest nickname in baseball history. <laughs> That's cool. That's and, right. and, and it fit him. Yep. Yeah, because Cool was cool. <laughs> Yeah, cool was cool. You know, snazzy dresser, as Buck O'Neill would say, you know, dapper. And, and, and so that persona fit him. Sure. And for those who might be hearing that name for the very first time, Cool Papa Bell, his real name is James. But when, you're, when your nickname is so iconic that everybody thinks that that's your name, mm-hmm. it's pretty special. Now, I agree. Uh-huh. But his real nickname was James, but everybody knew him as Cool Papa. And, and Cool Papa Bell is still believed to be the fastest man to ever play this game. Could turn off the lights and be in bed for the... Before the room went dark. That's right. Before the room went dark. And that is actually a true story. (laughs) But as I tell our guests here all the time, you don't have to fix a lot of speed to Cool Papa Bell. Cool Papa Bell once stole 175 bases in a less than 200 game season. What? He twice, honest to God's truth, twice scored from first base on a bunt in exhibition games against Major League All-Stars. Plays like the bunt and run, hit and run, created, perfected in the Negro League. Wow. Later picked up by Major League Baseball. I did not know yeah. that. Now, Cool was special. Cool was special. He wasn't just a great base stealer. He was a great base runner. Yeah, and, and Buck says that Cool, there are a lot of fast guys who have played this game. There were a lot of fast guys who played in the Negro Leagues, just as there were a lot of fast guys who played in the Major Leagues and currently play in the Major Leagues. But the thing that Buck says separated from Cool Papa from everybody else was his incredible ability to cut the bag on the inside, where most guys, because they're running so fast, they had to take that big, wide, rounding turn, but not cool. Buck says that cool Papa would be so low to the ground, Paul, that he could literally smack the bag with his hand and not fall over. Whoa. Well, that's God given. Man. Yes, sir. Yeah, no, no, no. So uh, I tell you now, all you physics folk, don't try to figure this out by physics. No, 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 no. That is physics defined. This is God given here. Yeah, no, no. Us mere mortals can't do that. You know, so. So speaking of nicknames, right before we started uh, recording this podcast, you pick up the phone from a gentleman by the name of Mudcat. Jim Mudcat Grant. Where does he get this, nick- this nickname at? Well, Mudcat was uh, from Lacoochee, Florida. And it had various variations of how people say he looked like a, a Mississippi catfish and this and kind of thing. And eventually <laughs> it vol- evolved into Mudcat. And all I know is whoever said he looked like a Mudcat, he proved him something different because he was winning. <laughs> Mudcat Grant is the first African-American pitcher to win 20 games in the major league. That's who you just talked to on That's the phone? That's who I was just on the phone with, Whoa. my dear friend, the legendary Jim Mutcat Grant. Um, but you know, that's part of what this, this gig has done. I have gotten to meet some of the most extraordinary people. You could not, as a kid growing up in Crawfordville, Georgia, to think that Jim Mutcat Grant would be calling me one day. Right. You know, and, and I'm calling him and, and we, Dave Winfield and Ozzie Smith, uh, getting to know the legendary Henry Aaron and Willie Mays, my dear friend, the late, great Monty Irvin. I feel so blessed. Mm. Man, I'm from Crawfordville, Georgia. Crawfordville, Georgia is about as big as this museum. Sure. You know, it had about 500 people in it. Wow. I'm just a country boy. Right. You know, so it, it has been a tremendous blessing to get to do what I do and, and absolutely love the work that we do here at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, and it has afforded me an opportunity to meet some of the most amazing people that I could have never, as a child, ever dreamed of meeting. Mm. So I'm guessing that through your experience, you know, something amazing has happened to you all the time. Like, I always see you out and about, uh, looking sharp as always. But, you know, what was the last pinch me moment that you had where you're like, oh, Lord, I can't believe, I can't believe this or I'm, I'm in this situation. Wow. I mean, and there are a lot of them. I mean, to walk around this museum with, then he was getting ready to run for president, George W. Bush, to walk around this museum with General Colin Powell, to walk around this museum with First Lady Michelle Obama. Wow. Uh, but for me, the one moment that stands out beyond all of them is to walk around this museum with my childhood idol, the great Henry Aaron. Mm. Yeah, as a kid growing up in Georgia, I was nearly 12 years old. 
when it, when Aaron broke Ruth's record. It was a record that people thought would never be broken. And the fact that this black man in the South was about to break what many be believed to be the most hallowed record in, in sports history. And the, the pain and turmoil that it generated from a racial standpoint in our country. I remember even in my little town of Crawfordville, which was predominantly African-American, but there was still segregation even as a kid growing up in the 60s into the 70s. It was still very much a segregated little small rural town in Georgia, and there were those, you know, the old black men would sit on one side of the street mm. around the corner, and the older white men would sit on the other side of the sure. street around the corner, and you saw that. But as a kid, you don't pay it that much attention because that's just the way it is. Right. I remember going in through the back door of the little cafe in Crawfordville, but you didn't really question it because... That was just the way that it was. You didn't have anything to compare it to. You, you didn't have anything to compare right. it to. And the cook was going to be black. And she was going to take care of you when you got back there. Right. But they had a little, little isolated couple of booths in the very back in the little cafe. And, but, you know, I was almost 12 when, when, when Henry Aaron broke the record. And uh, I remember very vividly, I'm circling the bases in my mother's living room with my childhood idol when he hit record home run 715. So the old couch was first base, the TV right. was second base, the other little couch <laughs> was third base, and her recliner was home plate. And so as, as Henry Aaron is circling the bases in Fulton County Stadium, I'm circling the bases in Crawfordville, Georgia. So fast forward to 1999, Major League Baseball is celebrating his 25 years of him breaking that record. Hmm. You think about it. It took him 25 years before he finally got to enjoy what many believe to be the most prestigious accomplishment in sports history because of the painful nature of that, that time when his family was in hiding and he was getting death threats, bags of mail that threatened he and his family's life and uh, how he handled it so graciously. And, and so they're celebrating 25 years of him breaking Ruth's record. And so he's doing his Major League Baseball tour. The Royals bring him to Kansas City. Well, as fate would have it, old Buck, is out of town. So I get the assignment of touring my childhood idol through the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. That's divine intervention. Oh, Paul, I was a <laughs> nervous wreck. It is the only time that I've ever been starstruck. Really? And I'm still starstruck because I'm always reduced to that 12-year-old kid yes. every time I'm in the presence of the great Henry Aaron. Wow. And so they mic me up. We've got a throng of media following us. And I am escorting Henry Aaron and his wife, Billy, through the museum. Well, afterwards, we go over to the gym theater right across the street from the museum. They've got a public program that was hosted by my good friends, Joe Posnanski and Jason Whitlock. Yes, sir. I think a lot of times people forget we had two of the top national sports columnists writing for the Kansas City Star. That's true. Yes, and sir. And Joe Paz and, and Jason Whitlock. And they do a public program. The gym theater is filled to the rafters. And it was an amazing conversation. And then afterwards, I go up to the upstairs conference room in the gym theater, and Hank Aaron, his wife, Billy, and I are enjoying a platter of Gates barbecue ribs. <laughs> it doesn't get any better no, than that not. for me. Hanging out with my childhood <laughs> idol and eating ribs with yes, my childhood sir. idol, that by far is the greatest day in baseball for me. Oh Nothing goodness. will top that, but that's the beauty of baseball. Whoever your favorite player is as a child likely will be your favorite player for the rest of your life. Sure. And so in my mind, there will never be another baseball player better than Henry Aaron. Even if they are better than Henry Aaron, they still won't be better than Henry Aaron sure. in my mind. Because you but have all those experiences yeah, that, to solidify that's, that's, that as and, well. And, and that's baseball. Yes, sir. That, that is baseball. But that by far, you know, no disrespect to the president and, and Mrs. Obama and all the other plethora of political dignitaries and athletes that we've hosted here, they're not Hank Aaron. Not, not in this old country boy's eyes. You know what's funny about that? They'd probably say the same thing, though. You know, because yeah. he, he was a legend, right? Yeah. And still is to this day. You know, one of the things that we talk a lot about uh, here on the podcast is just, you know, getting out of whatever mental space that you don't want to be in, right? Because yeah. so many times when you're faced with challenge, it's easy to stay in that rut and only yeah. focus on the stuff that's not working. And so one of the things that you said, uh, I would love to, I would love to just provoke some thought in our listeners today. So if you're listening to this podcast, think about an individual in your life 
that if you met, you'd be absolutely starstruck. And why? I want you to go and share that story or that individual with a, a friend, a spouse, a loved one, whoever it may be, a coworker. Have a conversation about who you would be <laughs> starstruck to meet. That's an amazing story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I got to think about that one for myself. But I think that that's an awesome segue into Buck O'Neill. Yeah. And the reason why I think it's awesome is because, uh, again, everybody out in the world is dealing with struggle. And, I, and I'm never here to downplay anybody's struggle. But the honest to God's truth is somebody in this world always has it worse than you. Absolutely. And quite honestly, they're probably handling it just a little bit better. Yeah. So when you talk about these stories of uh, death threats and hate mail and all this stuff, I mean, I don't think there's a lot of folks that can relate that are listening to this podcast right now. So in your experience with one of the finest gentlemen on the planet ever, uh, Mr. Buck O'Neill, did you ever have conversations about how he dealt with that stuff and, and, and what role uh, mentally it played on him? Of course, of course. And, and he talked about it. And, you know, Buck was, as I mentioned off air, was the consummate glass half full guy. Yes, sir. While others saw the hardships, he saw the joy. Yeah, while others saw the arduous and long board bus rides, Buck saying, I'm seeing the countryside. Yeah. And, and so he always seemed to see life through a little bit different lens than a lot of other people. And so the optimism did truly abound with Buck, and, and it was infectious. Yeah, it absolutely. Now, it didn't mean that they enjoyed the things that happened to them. No, no. They didn't like what would occur as they traveled the highways and byways of our country, not knowing where you can stop and get something to eat or have a place to stay. But they wouldn't allow that to consume them. Mm. And, and I think, for me, the thing that I find so amazing, and this is with every single Negro League player that I've ever had an opportunity to meet, none of them were bitter. None of them. And, and, and Paul, had they been bitter, we would have all said you had every right to be bitter. Sure. But none of them would. And I think that's why they live such long, fulfilled lives. That is why, that is why Buck O'Neill lived to be 94. Mm. You know, and I think that is why he, he was able to squeeze every ounce of joy out of those 94 years on this earth. He refused to allow his heart to be hardened with hate. And he would not hate those who perpetrated acts against him. And that, to me, is an amazing and endearing quality. And for Buck O'Neill, it goes back to a simple thing that his father told him when he was a little boy. Treat every man the way you want to be treated. The golden rule. That's it. Man, we all know the golden rule. Sure. But we don't all live the golden rule. Yes, sir. And Buck took something that his daddy said to him as a boy and that carried him throughout the rest of his life. It was the guiding principle for him throughout the rest of his illustrious life. And, and, I, and I think that's the thing that I take away most from being around Buck and being around a lot of the other Negro. Monty Irvin had that same persona. Ernie Banks had that. I'm sure they got angry. I'm sure they were upset with things that took place. But again, they were seeming able to just let it roll on off the shoulders, man. Because as Buck would say, hate eats you up from the inside. Ain't that the truth? Yeah, hate will kill you. And, and, and as we know, none of us are born into this world hating anyone. No, hate is a learned behavior. And he says, I never learned to hate. Simple that's, as that. So that's an interesting subject and one that we've never broached. Um, you know, I talk a lot about, so I'm a motivational speaker by trade. So I speak a lot with organizations about fun. And the F is your foundation, everything that you are, what yeah. you've become throughout the years, your experiences in life, your DNA, all that stuff, how you communicate, personality style, all that. The U is understanding others' perspectives. So how do you, how do you create meaningful interactions and how do you show a genuine interest in others? What types of questions do you ask to, to ensure that people feel like you genuinely care? And the N is, is next steps, you you know, Dale Carnegie once said the largest room in the world is a room for improvement. So no matter how great you are, you could all get just a Absolutely. little bit better, right? So um, when I'm thinking about what you just said, no one's born with hate in their heart. You know, oftentimes when we talk about foundation, I believe that our experiences in life shape our belief system. Mm -hmm. And that belief system drives our behaviors and ultimately those behaviors drive our emotions. So ideally, if you've ever had a bad day, you could trace that bad day all the way back to a specific experience that drove yeah. that. So my question to you is, when you say that no one is ever born with hate in their heart, you think it's all a learned, uh, a learned behavior. So that's upbringing? That's yeah. upbringing. That's exactly it. You take a room full of kids, 
put them all on the playground. What do they do? They play. That's sir. Yes, yeah. sir. They. That's the beauty not, of sports too, that, right? Uh, well, it, it unified us. Yes, in, sir. In ways that other things in our society really didn't. But kids don't see color. Hmm. No, they don't see color. They just see other kids. And it's only until they are brought up into this world that someone teaches them to hate you because you're this or to hate me because I'm that. You know, and, and so if we didn't teach hate, there would be no hate. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think innately we know right from wrong. Sure. Yeah, there's something innate in us that kind of helps us know right from wrong. But unfortunately, you still have those who teach hate. You teach someone to not like someone because of their religious background. Mm. You teach someone to not like someone because of the color of their skin. Uh, you treat, you teach someone to not like someone because of their sexuality. Yes. You know, and, and so it is unfortunate. I hope that as a society, we will continue to evolve and move away from teaching hate, um, which is why I think this story is so mightily and vitally important because I just transcribed to the belief that the more we know about one another, the easier it is for us to get along with one another. Agree. And, and I think, Paul, what we find is that we have far more similarities than we do differences. Yes, sir. But our differences are not things that we should be running away from. We should be embracing them. Those are the things that make us unique. But we're so scared to talk about them. But we're scared of differences. Mm. We're scared. You don't look like me. Now I'm scared of you. Yes. No, no, no. You shouldn't be that way. Right. No, no. And, and, And so I hope that as a society, we will continue to evolve and grow. And so what we've taken, the premise of baseball, and, and there's a wonderful poster in our shop that I think brings it home full circle. The poster says 440 feet is 440 feet, no matter what color your skin is. Whoa. Yeah. To think that these athletes couldn't play baseball because they were black. Right. Yeah. I mean, come on now. That got to be, <laughs> that, I mean, that come got on now. Be, that got to be the dumbest thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man well listen you know what i found and this isn't a knock on anybody except it is the hateful people aren't always the the, the sharpest tools no, no, of the no, 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 no. you know and it's sad because it, you know it does Heart, hate hate just eats you up sure you know if you wake up every single day and you hating somebody you don't know and you don't even know why you're hating them right but you're just saying i'm supposed to hate this individual it's something wrong. That's true. It's something wrong. So have you then, because, so you have, you've made it, you've made it a lifelong journey yeah. um, to support black heritage and, and the history. And forgive me if, is that, is that correct? I mean, essentially, I mean, through the story of the Negro Leagues, oh, it's, yeah. it's, it, it's it, exposing individuals to a culture that not everybody has experienced. It became a passion. But you know, even more, and, and I always couch this in this manner. The story of the Negro Leagues is not an African-American story. It is an all-American story. <laughs> this is the kind of story that we love in this That's country. That's true. Because this story is about pride, is about passion, is about perseverance. It is about the refusal to accept the notion that you're unfit to do anything, so I'll show you. Yeah, and it's all based on one simple principle. You won't let me play with you, and I'll just create a league of my own. But that is the American way. Right. Yeah, that's, that's everything that America prides herself in. And the Negro Leagues embodies that triumphant, fighting American spirit. And that's why people, when they come here, they fall in love with this story. But what not to love about this story? Mm. Yeah. You know, the belief in yourself, the determination, the perseverance, the passion, the courage to go on when others say you can't. Right. I'll show you I can. Yeah. And that's what America, that's what makes America so special. And I tell people all the time, this story embodies the American spirit unlike any story in the annals of American history. And, and that's why it's such a triumphant story. There's nothing sad about this story. I do think people expect to be introduced to a sad, somber story, because we obviously know that this story is anchored in the ugliness of American segregation. Yes, sir. A horrible chapter in this country's history. But again, out of segregation rose this wonderful story of triumph and conquest. Mm. Yeah. And, And that's where, and then alongside these tremendously gifted and talented baseball players, 
Hey, man, you meet some of the greatest baseball players to ever put on a baseball uniform. We almost de-emphasize the baseball players because for us, it's a given that you're going to meet some of the best to ever play. But it's the story that has escaped us. Yeah, it's the story that had escaped the pages of American History Book, which is why countless generations of us could go through our formal educations without knowing one of the most significant chapters, not in baseball history, but in American history, and that's the rich and compelling story of the Negro League. My goodness. They couldn't have selected a better uh, ambassador. <laughs> so I have just so many questions, and I always look at the clock, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, we got, we got about 20 more minutes here. So, I, I, so first of all, one of the things that really stuck out to me is, oh, I can't play your game? Or you won't let me play with you? Okay, well, we'll create a league of our own, right? And there's so many folks out there that get so infatuated with being accepted by others, right? I I mean, just think about every day when you get dressed, you look in the mirror. It's not always, damn, I look good. It's, oh, I wonder what they're going to think of me, right? And so hearing you say that, it's just so refreshing because... I just, I often wonder how liberating, how great people would feel if they could just remove their ego and the fear of what everybody else thinks of them and just enjoy themselves. And that's what I heard you say just now. But, but to take that one step further, you talked about this all American story. Yeah. You know how many wonderful stories there are out in the world today that for one reason or the other aren't told? Haven't been told. Not only are they not told, Some people just don't have the ability to tell them. So my question to you is, you are a tremendous storyteller. (laughs) One of the best I've ever heard. Not news to you, because that's why everybody's always asking you to be on their podcast or be an interview or whatever it may be. Is this something that you were born with, the ability to tell a story? or Tell me about that. Honestly, I don't know where it came from. I really don't. Well, I do know where it came from. (laughs) I, I, I take that back because it came from Buck. And it came from being around Buck and Monty Irvin, the guys that I got an opportunity to meet. And storytelling is such a big part of African-American culture because most of African-American history has never been documented in history books. So it was your grandfather, your grandmother sitting you down at their knee, at their feet, and then telling you about this piece of history. You know, Buck telling us, you should have seen Josh Gibson. You see, this, should have seen Cool Papa Bell. You should have seen Satchel. And uh, me being around Buck, I think, helped me learn how to tell stories. Because no matter how many times Buck O'Neill told a story, he was going to tell it to you like it was the first time he ever told it. And I think for those of us who ascribe to be storytellers, the greatest compliment that you can ever receive is someone saying, I felt like I was there. Sure. Because what you're trying to do is paint a picture. Yes. And so when I give the tour, it is a very immersive experience. I'm tired by the time that (laughs) I'm done because I want you to feel it. Yes. I want you to feel like you were there. Right. And, And that requires a lot of energy and it's a lot of effort and but I, I relish in doing that. And, and I think now when I tell these stories, I guess in my mind and in my heart, it is keeping Buck O'Neill alive. It is keeping Monty Irvin alive. Sure. It is keeping all these wonderful people, Mamie Peanut Johnson, and all these wonderful people that I've gotten an opportunity to meet and learn from. And I draw strength from them, inspiration from them. And I get to keep their stories alive. So who, uh, who's your young Padawan that you're, uh, that you're, that you're getting ready to... Uh, I mean, it's going to be some time, obviously, but these stories can't die. No, we can't let them die. No, we, we absolutely cannot let them die. And, and I think people still enjoy these stories today just as much as they did when Buck O'Neill was telling them, when Buck O'Neill was introduced to the world in a mainstream way by Ken Burns in the epic Ken Burns documentary. And the thing that Buck would tell me, he said, Paul... I've been telling these stories for 40 years and nobody ever listened. <laughs> and, and Ken Burns gave him a platform and people listened and they fell in love with Buck O'Neill. He was 82 years young at that time. And I'll never forget the headline in the Kansas City Star says, a star is born 
at 82. Wow. Yeah, when the rest of us would be a shutting it down. A mega star. <laughs> yes, yes. And when the rest of us would have been shutting it down, ready to shut it down, it jettisoned an, an entirely new career for Buck. He may have become more famous after his playing days than he was when he was a star playing for the Kansas City Monarchs. And, and, but that's the beauty, and he was able to capture that moment, and God blessed him to live for another 12 years where he got to gallivant all across this country preaching the gospel of the Negro Leagues and the virtues of his museum to any and everybody who would listen. You know, when you go back and look at the Ken Burns documentary, what, what grabs you was this very charming, gentle man telling these wonderful stories to baseball fans that they'd never heard before. Mm. And Paul, he did it with a twinkle in his eye and a smile that lit up the screen. And America literally fell in love with Buck O'Neill. That's true. I know I did. And uh, I, there's, a, there's quite a few listeners, I'm certain, that have never heard of Buck O'Neill or know the story of him. So uh, just briefly, yeah. uh, what would you say, obviously, his, his shining accomplishment was this, this museum. This, no question. And so what drove him to create this beauty? The same thing that I think we all aspire to, not to be forgotten. Mm. Yeah. He didn't want these heroes of the Negro Leagues to ever be forgotten. He wanted the story to live on. And in the final equation, I think that's what we all want. Sure. We want people to remember us. That's true. And that's what museums do. Yep. We, we keep them alive. We keep their stories alive. And he was very proud of what they had accomplished in building a league of their own and showing the world that they could play this game as well as anyone ever played this game. And as I tell the people who come here... Our story is not about the adversity. It's so easy to dwell on the hardships, the difficulties of those times. But rather, our story is about what they did to overcome the adversity. Yes, sir. That's the real story. Right. Yeah, these athletes never cried about the social injustice. They went out and did something about it. And, and that, to me, is what makes it so compelling and so awe-inspiring. And Buck wanted that story to live on because the fear was that the story of the Negro Leagues was going to die when that last Negro Leaguer left the face of this earth. This story was on the verge of extinction if it's not for the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. Yeah, it was going to die. It was going to die. This story is too precious. It is too compelling, too inspirational to allow it to die when that last Negro Leaguer leaves the face of this earth. As I tell our guests all the time, the Negro Leagues Museum doesn't need to survive. It has to survive hmm. so that we don't lose this. It's too much here. It is too much here. So when our young people come here, they not only gain an, an educational experience, they draw inspiration from what these athletes were able to do in the face of adversity. Yes, sir. Yeah. And I feel it too. And I feel it through your passion. And I think that the, the one thing that you just said that really resonated with me amongst many other things, obviously, is, is I feel like you just kind of captured the whole reason why I asked you to be a guest today. <laughs> and so specifically, everybody's going through something. Everybody's dealt with challenge or whatever. But you said, this isn't, this isn't a story of the struggle. Mm -mm. This is a story of what you do in the face of the struggle. Yeah. And so it's, it's not a question of whether anybody listening to this podcast or anybody out there in the world today is going to face a challenge. You're going to. You're going to if you live on this earth, like whenever, you're going to face challenges. Man. But, but the answer or, or what differentiates you and the way that you experience life is what do you do when faced with yeah. challenge? And to your point, this is a magnificent example of what can be created when you just set those challenges aside and you don't let them dictate who you are or how you want to experience life. But, but you think about at the crux of this sport that we're talking about. Yes, sir. Baseball. Yes, sir. Failure. Yeah. Failure is what this sport is all about. That's true. You're going to fail more times than you succeed in this sport. If you get three hits every 10 trips to the plate, man, you're a Hall of Famer. Right. So baseball teaches us a lot about ourselves because you've got to literally pick yourself back up, get in the batter's box, and figure out how I'm going to hit this guy. This guy done struck me out three times. Right. But now I got to figure out how I'm going to hit him. Right. You know, and I may not hit him that day. Sure. But now I got to get back in there eventually and get the confidence to get back in there. So you learn a lot about yourself with, through this sport. And I think that is what makes it almost the irony of these who wanted to play this sport. Sure. So that they could prove they could play this sport. 
And, and so, yeah, that's all part of what this story is all about. It mirrors life in many respects. And we're all going to be faced with challenges. There are days, man, when things don't go your way. You know, I'm out there trying to raise money and people tell you no. Right. Yeah, and they tell you no and you're feeling a little sorry for yourself. You want to <laughs> lick your wounds and that kind of thing. But you know, you can't do that. You got to get right back in the baddest box. And I got to go figure out now how I can get the next guy to tell me yes. Yes. Yes, we will support what you're doing. Yes, we believe in what you're doing. We understand why this is so important. And so that's all part of it. I tell people all the time, there are days when I don't believe that I get paid to do what I do. Right. There are some other days when they don't pay me enough <laughs> to do what I do. But fortunately for me, there are more of the former than the latter. Sure. It is truly a labor of love. It is not only for me, but I think for our entire team here at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, because it's something that you said in your intro. We all understand that we're doing something that is bigger than we are. Mm. And that if we do this right, that it will stand the test of time. It will be here for future generations to come to enjoy and in our own way, we have the opportunity to leave a legacy. And not very many of us get to do stuff that's bigger than we are. That's true. Most of the things that we do in our society are driven by the fact of me. There's a meism kind of in the way. We always are looking to acquire as much stuff as we can. We want to generate as much money as we possibly can. And that's human nature, I understand. It's ego. You want to take care of your families, you need to do these kinds right. of things. But I love the fact that we're all driven here by leaving something back that will be left here for others to enjoy. Mm. That motivates each and every one of us. And for me, the fact that I want to build upon what Buck O'Neill left us. Yes, sir. Yeah, I don't want it to fall. I don't want it. I want it to live on. And I hope that when my granddaughter has children, she'll come by here and say, you know, your great-grandfather has something to do with this place. She's yeah. going to say, he's a megastar. Yeah, your great-grandfather was a megastar. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we talk a lot, man, I came into this conversation, Bob, and I said to myself, you're an individual, you're such a phenomenal storyteller, you got such a phenomenal story, and you're just such a wonderful ambassador that I'm sure you find yourself talking about this museum and Buck O'Neill uh, far more than you ever get to talk about yourself. And so, and, and that probably, that's comfortable for you. Yeah. But for somebody like me, I look at that and I'm like, I want to know Bob. Like, yeah. he's a tremendous guy. I want to know, yeah. I want to, I want to know what makes him tick. And so specifically, you talked about dealing with challenges in life and we all face it and all that. And there's still hate out there. Uh, yeah. I got a couple questions for you related to hate. So recently, and I think it was June of this year, you know, you were yeah. faced and, and, and the museum was faced with a challenge. Tell the, tell the audience a little bit about that. Late June of this year, the museum had been working on a wonderful expansion project to build the Buck O'Neill Education and Research Center in the site of the Paseo YMCA. Well, the Paseo YMCA is the birthplace of the Negro Leagues. That's where the leagues were formed in 1920. Andrew Root Foster led a contingent of eight independent black baseball owners into that very building. And out of that meeting came the birth of the Negro National League, the first successful organized black baseball league. Well, the old Paseo YMCA had been abandoned since the early to mid 1970s. And so the museum acquired that property a number of years ago and then set out to redevelop that property and convert that old historic landmark into an education and research center in memory of my friend, the late great John Jordan Buck O'Neill. And so we had restored the exterior, we had gutted the interior, started the interior de design phase of it and had basically finished the first floor of that building. Well, in late June of this year, Someone decided that they would go into the building, cut a mainline water pipe, and deliberately flooded the building, creating about a half million dollars mm. worth of damage in the building. And I'll be honest, it knocked the wind out of my sails. What does that um, look like for you? Because you're like that guy that I know. Uh, you're I know. always. It looks like you're always happy. So when yeah. someone knocks the, the wind out of your sails, what does that look like for you? Well, at that particular time, because initially we didn't know that it had been. Deliberately done. Sure. You know, you're thinking that a water pipe had burst and you're still feeling pretty bad by, yeah. by yourself. But you know, again, accidents occur. It happens. Yeah, accidents occur. But once you found out that it was deliberate, mm. it did. It just really hurt that much that someone would be so malicious that they would create such a heinous act for, on a property that everybody was excited about. The community was excited because we had ridded the community of this eyesore, a place that had been 
uh, vacant that was harboring illicit activity. Vagrants were living there, and, and we had taken that all away and beautified, and it was the only blighted building on the Paseo. The Paseo is a majestic boulevard, mm. and this was the only blighted building on the Paseo. We had eradicated that, and everybody was so much looking forward to seeing what the final uh, results of this building were going to be, and then somebody goes in and deliberately does this and causes a tremendous amount of damage. You know, with the mindset, I think, of trying to destroy the, the project altogether. And so at that point in time, man, you're ready to wave the white flag on humanity. Oh. Yeah, you know, you're ready to give up because you yeah. think, man, I mean, this is about as low as it gets for me. I think it ranks up there with probably the two or three most disappointing days in my life. Wow. Personally and professionally when that happened. Probably number one is the day that Buck O'Neill didn't get in the Hall of Fame. I could see that. that. That hurt me tremendously as it did a lot of people around this country. But when I walked in and we find out that the pipe had been cut and that someone had turned the water on and deliberately flooded the building, at that point, you are kind of ready to wave the white flag. You're saying to yourself, okay, man, you know, this is it. People will just do some despicable things. And you know you can't give up on humanity. Right. No, you can't give up on humanity. And then I'm reminded of something that the late, great Buck O'Neill said and it just has to resonate, and it did resonate, that people will do bad things, good people will fix them. And the good people started to come to the forefront. All of a sudden, this outpouring of love from people that we didn't know, that I didn't know, who knew how much I was hurting and how this hurt the museum, and they would call, and they would write, and then they started sending in. I was trying to stop people from sending money because I wasn't sure yet what the insurance company sure. would do. Because you always want to be good stewards of people's resources. Absolutely. It's the first time ever that I've been at the museum <laughs> that I'm trying to encourage people not to send money. Hold on now. Because you know that, that is counterintuitive now. That's true. My job is to ask you to send money. But in this instance, I'm trying to tell people, hold off, we don't know yet. And yet people continue to send dollars. Sure. Literally teens. Kids sending in $5, $10. People were doing special events around the country. People I never knew, but they wanted to do something to help fix this. And not only did the resources, and the resources obviously are going to help us move forward with this project, but man, it renewed your spirit. Mm. Yeah, it renewed your spirit. And you know what? We all know that there are more good people than bad sure, people. Sure, absolutely. We always has, always will be. But sometimes you have to be reminded. That's true. Yeah, sometimes you have to be reminded. <laughs> and that was probably one of those times I had to be reminded. Yeah. You know, and, um, but it, it, it just renewed your spirit. It, it gave you a new level of energy. Um, but as I tell people all the time, you can't be a steward of this story and wallow in self-pity. No. No, you can't do it. No, no, it'd no, be, no, you'd be you, against everything. Everything that this story <laughs> is all about. That's right. No, so, you know, I had my day or two where I licked my wounds, and then it, it became more important now for me to dig in. And now there's an even greater resolve, because you never want the hater to have the last word. Mm -hmm. No, no, uh-uh. So now there's an even greater resolve to finish Buck's dream. Yeah, to get this education and research center that he so desperately wanted to have that would help introduce young people not only to this story, but the life lessons that stem from this story. Sure. And, and we're just even more determined now to get it done. So, yeah, it, it was a little bit of a speed bump, but that's all. Sounds like uh, the, the humanity of others lifted you up. Oh, of course. I mean, when you question the you humanity of others, right? you start right? questioning. Absolutely. <laughs> you start to question, and then maybe it's a higher power. I don't know. Yes. Again, for those who sure. believe yeah, yeah. in divine intervention. Sure. Perhaps it's a higher power that reminds us, you know, and sometimes you need to be reminded. Sure. And, and I think that may be the case here. And, and again, there's tremendous outpouring from those around this country who, like I said, the more majority I never met personally. They've been following the museum. They've been following me, whether it's on Twitter or what have you. And they just wanted to step up and they wanted to help. And I also think it speaks to how Buck O'Neill, 12 years since his death, is still, his legacy looms just as large today as it did when he was here with us in an earthly fashion. And that means the world to me. I think it means the world to all of us here at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. I don't want people to ever forget Buck O'Neill. And 
hopefully if we continue to do what we need to do, they won't forget Buck O'Neill. And if we get this building that will bear his name, there's no way for you to get forget Buck O'Neill. Well, so when we those remove those important. words, if, and we just make them happen, because I know with yeah. you at the helm, yeah, it's gonna happen. these stories aren't going to die, no. and it's going to happen. Yeah, it's so, happen. Uh, Mr. Kendrick, I, I just got to tell you, I admire you a great deal. Um, remove the Negro Leagues. Yeah. Uh, I just think that you're one of the most tremendous individuals <laughs> on the planet. And so if, if, if somebody wants to learn more about you or the Negro Leagues Museum or they want to make a donation, where could they go? Well, you can certainly learn more about this museum. And if you want to make a donation to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, just visit our website at nlbm.com, or you can also go to www.nlbmdonate.com okay. uh, to make a tax-deductible contribution to this museum. You know, I'm just an old country boy. I'm just an old country boy. And, man, I just feel so blessed. I grew up in such humble roots. You know, I'm sure my kids get tired of hearing the stories of, you know, how I had, it. I had an outhouse when I was a kid and <laughs> these kinds of things that most city kids, we didn't have indoor plumbing, sure. you know, when I was a kid initially. And those things shape your experiences. It, it kind of gives you a greater appreciation for stuff that other people might take for granted. That's true. Yeah. And so, uh, but I would not trade it for the world. I had two very loving parents who, while we didn't have great means, man, I didn't know we were poor. You know, they, I, they, I had everything I needed. You know, I may not have had everything I wanted, but I had everything I needed. And, and they instilled in me and my brothers the value of an education. Um, they instilled, again, that, that attitude and mindset of just treating people with kindness. And, and I hope that that is something that I carry forward with me the rest of my life, I, I again, I, I take and draw a lot of that from being around Buck. Uh, you don't ever really quite understand why God puts you in places where he puts you and the people that cross your life, good and bad, for a reason. Most definitely. Yeah, all for a reason. You yes, draw sir. something from every single that's, incident that's the truth. that happens. Yeah, That's your foundation. Yeah. And uh, I, I think ultimately we could sit here. You know, I, I was telling you, I was talking to Joel Goldberg before yeah, coming in here. Guy. He just did a podcast. With you. He's a Royals broadcaster. And he said, Paul, you're doing the Lord's work. He said, we can't talk to Bob Kendrick enough. I mean, we <laughs> give him a microphone and there's still not enough time or stories that would come out. I would love... To have you again and talk more about yeah, some of the that, amazing yeah, no, no, stories man. that have happened. Because we didn't even... We didn't get we, chance to we, do we that did. <laughs> <laughs> So from the bottom of my heart, I'd like to say thank you. As a token of my appreciation, I got a book drop on November 13th. I'm going to give you a copy, and I'm going to make a personal donation for $250 to the Negro Leagues Museum. I know it's not a lot. Hey, man, no, every dollar counts. And November 13th... Yes, sir. ...is Buck O'Neill's 107th birthday. Happy birthday, Buck. What is that? And, and I know he would appreciate that donation to the Negro Leagues baseball museum and the fact that it's going to happen on your book is dropping on his birthday uh is even more special but november 13th would be buck's 107th birthday and you know each year we continue the tradition of celebrating his life he used his birthday for over a decade to help raise money and awareness for his museum and then after he passed away 12 years ago we just continue the tradition of celebrating his illustrious life and we do a big birthday celebration and we throw a party this year, a fashion show. and Ooh. Yeah, fashion show on Friday, November the 9th. Bucks Bash on November the 10th. And for anybody who are fans of funk, the legendary Gap Band. Now they call themselves what? the Gap Experience, but the Gap Gap Band will be performing here for Bucks 107. I'm trying to ride day. that party train. <laughs> yes, there you go. <laughs> See what there you know about it. There you go. <laughs> Listen, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> as always, we want to thank you for tuning in. This is one of my favorites ever. This gentleman is just such a tremendous storyteller. If you want to learn more about the story, please visit the website as referenced. Uh, hopefully we've inspired you to be a part. Maybe you want to make a donation. Maybe you just want to come check it out. Yeah. There's a lot of history here. Uh, and it just reiterates the fact that no matter how much you're going through, somebody's always going through it. And it's what you do in those times of challenge that really helps define you. And we are surrounded by individuals that made the most out of a terrible situation. Guys, from the bottom of my heart, I'd like to say thank you very much. Thank you to our kind guest, Mr. Bob Kendrick. We'll catch you on the flip side. Have some fun today, and we'll talk to you soon. 